Final hour of the Hoffman Show here on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. And it is my pleasure to welcome to the show a voice you hear on the show all the time, although rarely we do it this way. Uh, live, it is Logan Paulson, my co-host, of course, for Take Command, a man who played 10 NFL, 10 NFL seasons, uh, including one, by the way, in San Francisco, and is thus reduced to being introduced as my co-host on Take Command. Uh, Logan, what's up, buddy? <laughs> Not much, man. How you doing? Busy day for you, I would imagine. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. So the commanders have hired Adam Peters, something that we talked about as a possibility a couple weeks ago and kind of dismissed because we all thought he would stay in San Francisco. And yet, here we are. Josh Harris got his guy. What's your initial reaction? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think when you listen to stuff like that John Thomas put out and, you know, like Josh Harris is a guy who gets the guy that he wants and is very uh, deliberate and focused in terms of that attention. And it became very clear, you know, kind of early on in this process, uh, maybe actually I say early, I mean, the short, short lived process, right. Um, that uh, in the last 24 hours, that that was kind of the guy. So when that was the report, when was that yesterday, I kind of anticipated that, you know, there would be some fireworks today or tomorrow and looks like it was today. And I'm really happy for the organization. I'm happy for the team. I think that, uh, you know, obviously I spent some time in San Francisco I know Adam Peters from my time there, um, and we have some mutual friends that have kind of kept us in contact, and I just think he's uh, – there couldn't be a, a more qualified person for the position. Obviously, he's um, – you know, my, my personal experience with him, I just think he's a fantastic human being. Um, his ability to relate to players, his ability to kind of account for the personal aspect of the challenges of playing in the NFL and understand that, I think it's fantastic. I think his relationship with the coaches – in San Francisco is fantastic, and it's something that I hope that he brings here. And I'm just, you know, like a little anecdote story, like, you know, San Francisco come, came, came and played out here, and, you know, he's the assistant GM of San Francisco. He has a lot of people trying to talk to him, and we bumped into each other up in the press box, and he was like, it was like no time had passed at all. And, I, and it takes a special kind of charisma and understanding of your role to acknowledge people like that. So I think it's a pretty fantastic opportunity from a person standpoint to get a guy like that here. And not to mention his, his other qualifications that we can talk about in a second. Yeah, for sure. Um, what was his role in San Francisco when you were there? And then like, what were the interactions? Because I think it's interesting because there's some schools of thought that say front office people basically like shouldn't be in the locker room. They're like, no, that's the right. coach's territory. Um, but it seems like in San Francisco, there's this really amazing kind of uh, cohesion, collaboration, and understanding between Kyle and his staff and, and John Lynch and his staff, of which Adam Peters was a part of until he accepted this job. So the fact that you have personal experience with him in a, as a player, I think is is pretty interesting to begin with. So like, what was his role and what were those interactions like that Washington players can presumably expect here? Yeah, so I think one of the things, you know, like when I first got to Washington, just as a point of juxtaposition, like the, the head of player pro personnel at the time believed that the scouts and the pro personnel people shouldn't talk or try to develop personal relationships with the players. And that's not, I don't think, a bad thing. I think, you know, sometimes personal relationships can bias your evaluations of guys. And um, and I think, you know, it led to kind of a different working environment. I don't want to make it seem like Adam Peters is in the locker room every single day, but you'd see him around the building. And he would just be like, hey, Logan, how are you? And the fact that he knew my name was a big deal because I think he was like assistant GM or assistant to the GM at the time, whatever his official title was. He had just come over from Denver, um, which obviously had just won a Super Bowl prior to his arrival in San Francisco with Peyton Manning, um, I think, you know, is, is pretty special. And I think it just shows, again, at a level of pro professionalism that I'm, I hearken back to how Sean McVay was when he was here in Washington, his ability to like know every single human being's name in the building, right? He knew the, the, the equipment guys, he knew the training staff, he knew the janitors. And I think Adam Peters kind of embodied some of that same interpersonal charisma. And I think that with his kind of, his, his gravity that he brings when he brings to when, when he walks into a room, I think it's pretty special, and I think it's all things you need to be kind of a modern GM. And I think it's I think it's kind of exceptional in a way. You know, you hear stories, time reporter on some stories. I've heard stories tangentially through connections and contacts to the NFL of him just understanding how challenging it is for players. So I think I think that empathy is it doesn't stop him from being a professional, but I also think it makes a better working environment and a, and a, and a culture that respects people and respects humans as opposed to the commodities that the players sometimes are seen as. Culture. There's that word again. Uh, Logan Paulson with us here on the Hoffman Show. Uh, of course, co-host with me on Take Command, contributor here on the Team 980 and 106.7 The Fan, Command Center for the Commander's YouTube page, uh, and played 10 years 
in the NFL. All right, so the relationship with the coaching staff is going to be critically important. Before we talk about who might be a good fit with him here, there's some obvious obvious ones, uh, at least through where I sit. Um, what was his relationship like with Kyle in terms of making sure that Kyle had the players that he needed to go out and execute on Sundays with? I think before you talk about that, you got to talk about kind of how he's viewed around the NFL in terms of his ability to evaluate talent. And he's widely considered, you know, pretty much everybody you talk to as one of the premier talent evaluators in the NFL. And then to kind of peel back that onion a little bit, I think to your point, Craig, one of the things he does an excellent job of, of, you know, everyone's got their big board and they try to approximately fit it to what the team needs. But, you know, in my experience, scouts have a hard time with that because they don't really understand the football side of it. So when you talk to scouts, you know, they're kind of like, this is my number one guy, kind of regardless of scheme, right? I think Adam Peters, from what I understand and from people that I've talked to around the NFL, has a really good feel for identifying what, how to value players based on what the coach, is, coach wants from the player. So I think you see that, you know, to a T in San Francisco, right? They go out, they draft Debo Samuel, they draft Brandon Ayuk, guys that maybe – other teams and other organizations wouldn't value as highly because they're not prototypical for the position. But I think uh, Adam, to his credit, John Lynch, to his credit, and Kyle's communication with the two of them, they understand what they're looking for out of that position. They understand it doesn't need to be DK Metcalf. It doesn't need to be a Justin Jefferson. It can be a guy who's just excellent after the catch, who can get open through scheme and open through concept. And I think that's kind of what you saw there. I think you see that with how they kind of cultivated the defensive front in San Francisco. You also see it with how they kind of acquire offensive linemen. I think another thing that sticks out to me is just how aggressive, you know, and involved I've heard he was during the trade deadline for a lot of the people, for a lot of their big acquisitions. So I think that relationship, that understanding of the X's and O's and how to augment your process to best, to best accommodate those X's and O's, I think is a huge testament to what he does. And when I hear that from people, you know, around the NFL, I'm just like, that is what you want to hear. And it does, does it ensure success? Absolutely not, but it definitely kind of sets you up in a position where you're like, this guy understands the vision of the coach and can get that, get the, get the scouting staff to understand that same vision and get the best possible players in here to fit the vision uh, of the offense or the defense for that matter. Right. It's so wild to me that that's just not how everybody does it because players don't just play like there's no just line up and sandlot it like you're playing in a scheme it's the nfl these are the best coaches on the planet and if you're not getting guys to fit what they want offensively or defensively you're just you're asking to fail and i i the fact that he's one of the best at it is great and he's coming here but it's pretty wild to me that that's not standard operating procedure on literally 32 of 32 teams yeah and i think that there is a certain amount of people trying to do that but again i think that speaks to his skill set i think you're around guys I've been around multiple front offices and they're always trying to do that but it is there's a certain art to as you know and as we've talked about through our draft content that we do every single year there's a certain art to that ability and I think he's got that artistry um, that kind of flushes out the kind of analytic very detailed approach that he acquired when he was in uh, New England so I think it's, it's a guy that is very naturally talented at it a guy that was able to cultivate a skill set in many different systems New England um, obviously Denver and then San Francisco to kind of round out that process and allow him to find the best the best pieces uh, to fit what the coaches need. Logan Paulson with us, of course, co-host of Take Command with me. Uh, a couple times a week, you can catch it in your podcast feeds or on 106.7 The Fans YouTube page. All right, so that leads to the head coach discussion, which is now the next order of business. I can't believe we're on Friday, uh, on the Friday after Black Monday, and we're already... Got one down onto the head coach thing. This one's going to take a little bit longer because of how the structure of the interviews goes. But with Adam Peters here, um, does it change kind of your list at all or who you think the top candidates could or should be? Um, no, not really. You know, I kind of go off my personal biases. And I think that, for me, uh, you know, for me personally, and, you know, based on the list that's reported, I'm an offensive guy. I really like what what Ben Johnson's been doing in Detroit, there does seem to be kind of a pre-existing personal relationship with Spielman. And I think his brother, or there's some connection there to the front office. In yeah, Chris, Chris Spielman's the, I think, team president uh, there in Detroit with the Lions. So there's definitely going to be some right. connection there. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Bob Myers, you know, had a connection with Adam Peters. I think those are, those are two kind of very telling, uh, you know, personnel decisions by Josh Harris in terms of that group. 
And so I would kind of lean in that direction. Again, I don't know. That may be my own biases or clouding my judgment. I think all the coaching candidates, as we've talked about on our show, are very, very qualified. I'd be excited to have any, every single one of them. But again, I like offensive football. I think there's, um, you know, precedent for that, that offensive coaches tend to have, you know, quicker, um, success. I, I like that he's worked with a quarterback that was struggling in LA and then kind of revitalized his, revitalized his career. Cause obviously I think it's not insignificant that you're going to be picking a quarterback probably with the second overall pick. Obviously you could trade back. There's a million things you could do, but if you do pick a quarterback, you want somebody who understands how to maximize that position and, and elevate that position in a way that, um, you know, I think we were kind of hoping EB would do for Sam Howell. So I think that's kind of the hope there for me is when I see a, a talented offensive coordinator uh, on the market available, I think I look at the, the kind of recent history, Kyle, Sean, um, you know, the offensive coordinator in, I'm forgetting his name, in Minnesota at the moment, Mike Kevin, McDaniels, yeah. all those different guys, Kevin, yeah, Kevin O'Connell. Like that to me is kind of the direction that head coaching hires should go. It allows you to keep your offensive identity through through um, position coaching changes, through coordinator changes, through run game coordinator changes, which I think is incredibly important. So that's the one that, uh, that kind of calls to my attention and gets me really excited. But again, I think all those coaches have excellent pedigree and, and would do an excellent job given the opportunity. No doubt. And as, uh, as Nick Wagner pointed out earlier on our show, uh, Nick covered – uh, Bobby Sloak in San Francisco, where who obviously worked with Adam as well, so he becomes, to me, a, a really interesting one. And either way, those guys are running similar systems here. Um, and, and Nick used a phrase that I liked when talking about Ben Johnson in terms of kind of the approach, that like they're cut. He's not from the Shanahan tree, but he's cut from the same cloth. If you were kind of to describe that philosophy and, and what kind of players you need and kind of what Adam Peters is looking for, like how do Ben Johnson and Bobby Sloak work with Adam Peters to build a football team that fits the mold of what's winning in the NFL right now? Yeah. So I think, you know, to answer the first part of your question with Ben Johnson, I think when you watch Detroit's film, there's times where quite honestly, I'm watching, I'm like, I can't believe that this guy didn't work directly with Kyle or with Sean because it, it, it the offense is so, so similar. Obviously there's a little bit more gap scheme. Obviously there's a little bit more downhill element to it. But the, the principles, the, the foundation, the foundational pieces of Kyle's offense are there. And what I mean by that is the strong commitment to running the football. The, the, pe- the play action pass mirrors and is closely tied with that. They understand how to manipulate defenses to maximize concepts each and every week based on formation. So I think that's one of the reasons why I get so excited about that. And so like, what do those offenses entail? I think going out and identifying you know, offensive linemen that can fit that offensive scheme are really important. Finding the different body types for wide receiver. I think you see with Kyle, you see with Mike, um, you even see this in Minnesota to a certain extent with Kevin O'Connell, the importance of getting receivers that can stretch the field vertically to open up those horizontal passing windows. So can you find that personnel this week in, in, in this year's draft? There's a ton of receivers that have that skill set. So it feels very likely they'll be able to find a guy to supplement the, the receiving group they already have. So I think that's kind of what you're looking at offensively. And like you mentioned, you've got Bobby Sloak down in Houston, right? They've got these different body types at receiver. They've got Nico Collins. He's 6'3", 6'4", 215, 220 pounds, kind of your true X. They've got Tank Dell, who's small, slight. They've got a Dalton Schultz at tight end, who, again, can kind of work the seam. But they're all different types of skill sets that all can be maximized in the context of that offense. It's not just one size fits all. And I think understanding that as a personnel guy, as the GM now for Adam Peters is going to be extremely critical. So uh, when I look at that, I think that's how Peters elevates these groups is by getting in the office, communicating with Ben, Ben saying, these are the things I want to emphasize with my offensive philosophy and within the context of this team. And then it, you know, we talk about personnel from a, you know, a, a body type standpoint oftentimes, but I think it's also a personality standpoint. When you look at San Francisco, Cisco, one of the things that I draw when I watch them all the, when I watch them every single week is, the toughness that they have on that roster. And you can tell that's an intentional decision. So making sure you're not only finding the right guys physically, but finding the right guys from a, um, from a mental kind of study kind of mindset standpoint is also going to be a huge part of making sure that that identity from the GM to the head coach, to the team is seamless and executed at a high level. 
And that is a huge reason why when people ask me who should they take at number two, my answer is still, I have no idea because the next four months are going to be what tells us that as much as anything. Like everyone's got the tape now. No, There's no more games to be played at the college level. That's the evaluation process, uh, the tape process, but the scouting of like who these guys are as people is going to be pretty fascinating and, and the commanders can't have a better guy, it seems, to, to kind of parse through, sit down and talk with these potential quarterbacks and figure out who they are because your quarterbacks got to have that personality uh, if you're going to take them with that number two pick. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think, you know, this is not only a guy that, you know, has to be, if you're, if you're going number two, if you're going with the number two pick, a guy that is physically capable of doing it, but emotionally kind of capable of handling that next step to the NFL. And, and I say emotionally because it's not just X's and O's. It's not just, you know, studying. It's how you, are you the face of the franchise? Can you handle that pressure? I think this, we've talked about this at nauseum, how this city is ready. This area is ready to kind of a return to great greatness. And can you handle the pressure of that as a young player coming in? And so I think that, again, that's going to be a huge part of the evaluation process. And, and you know, who, I'm not saying they're going to take a quarterback at two, but maybe it, 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 it's involving, it's involved in your decision to kind of, Hey, we're going to trade this pick. We're going to move back and acquire more pieces because actually we think Penix is the guy and we can get him later. So I think that that's going to be a huge, extremely fun decision for, for everybody involved. And I can't wait to see how they handle it. If only we had some time to talk about it, you know, it's going to happen so <laughs> fast the next yeah. four months of podcasts. Uh, well, we have to, we'll do plenty <laughs> of head coach scouting first, by the way, um, really, really interesting, uh, exercise that Logan and I went through the other day that is available now on YouTube. And of course in the podcast feed on take command, originally Logan, we were just going to play a segment of this on the show, but instead we're talking to you about the breaking news here. Uh, but right. I also feel like what we did is, is, perfectly validated by what just happened here. Um, we did kind of a mathematical model, a very baseline model, but mathematical uh, chart of the best job openings available for head coach. And we said, look, based off these factors, ownership, the roster, the resources you have to, to rebuild a roster, um, the kind of the atmosphere around the organization, Washington's the best job. And by, by our model, it wasn't really even that close. And I think right. getting Adam Peters by Friday proves just how valuable this job is like we were right logan is basically what i'm trying to say yeah and i know a lot of people disagreed with us you're entitled to your opinion but i do feel somewhat vindicated after this news today so there you go yeah uh we probably should have mentioned the vegas golden knights when we talked about las vegas and other other teams in town that was a miss by us but you know what we missed the hockey team on the football podcast and one person from vegas finds it is an upset um <laughs> i'll deal with them when we're out there for super bowl you know We'll just there you go. That's it. Yeah, head on a swivel, Craig. Those, yeah. those Vegas fans. Yeah, are, no, I, I said I would deal with them, not they're going to deal with me. I, I really would like <laughs> it to be that direction. All right, uh, Logan Paulson, uh, make sure you check out all his stuff uh, for the commanders on their YouTube page. And of course, the Take Command podcast twice weekly, uh, which you can subscribe to right now Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, anywhere you get your podcast. Uh, Logan, uh, enjoy the weekend. Uh, good luck to, to your boy in the hockey tournament. And yes, I'll talk to you on you. Tuesday. Appreciate it. Sounds good, brother. Thanks. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.